Is Thank you, Rebel Voice. <laughs> um, but welcome to Images on the Web with uh, of Past, Present, and Future with Adam Silverstein. If you'll take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. I see people from all over, so that's kind of cool. Um, and yeah, thanks for inviting me to come do this talk. This is actually the first part of this talk is going to be um, a, a redo of my talk at WordCamp US this year, which is I'm just going to be digging into image formats on the web. And then um, that was a 15 minute lightning talk. And I spoke really fast the whole time to try to squeeze it into 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And so I'm going to do it a little slower this time. And hopefully you'll have questions for me. You know, please pop those in the chat or, or unmute or whatever. Uh, and then I also have some sort of extended stuff at the end uh, about sort of more about how WordPress handles images that you upload and how your browser handles them and also uh, kind of why it's why we might want to care about images. So with that, I'm going to uh, dig in. Um, this is me. I'm a developer relations engineer at Google. So I work closely with Chrome DevRel, uh, the content ecosystem, we call it, or the web, you might call it, um, and just trying to work with developers, uh, make developers live easier, uh, educate people about the tools that Google provides, like Chrome DevTools, Lighthouse, those kinds of things, and feedback from the development community, especially the WordPress community, uh, back to those teams building those tools. Um, and for the last uh, kind of, I'm, I'm also closely involved in WordPress core, and, and in the last year, I've been super focused on, focused on images and, and performance uh, in WordPress core. And this talk kind of comes out of that. So I'm going to talk about images on the web just in general. And then if we get to it, I'll talk about how WordPress and browsers handle images more particularly. And like I said, why it matters. So in terms of images on the web, uh, they kind of have two, two groups. There's the legacy image formats, I like to call them, that we're all familiar with, like GIF and JPEG and PNG. Uh, and then there's these modern image formats that are kind of coming down uh, the line or are with us now that are that are offered these kind of new features. And we're going to get into why those are exciting and what they might mean for your website or for your web tools. So the legacy formats, and, and by the way, all the images in this uh, slide deck were created by Imagen, which is uh, one of Google's internal uh, text to image tools. Uh, everyone's pretty excited about all these tools right now. Um, but I, you know, just typed in prompts that somehow were funny to me and related to images like and performance like this uh, dinosaur riding a tricycle. Uh, the GIF format's been around for 35 years, uh, maybe almost 36 now, uh, which is pretty amazing. Before we had GIF, we had uh, ASCII art. I think that was like, you know, you still have that actually, like if you boot up a Linux machine, you'll probably see a tu uh, tuxedo wearing penguin that's made of ASCII art. But GIF was 35 years ago, we had GIF and it's supported everywhere. You can use it in almost any place you can use an image. And it has animation, which was pretty exciting when it came out. Um, it has transparency, so you can put images over a background, which was also, again, kind of exciting for images. It had compression and lossless compression, meaning um, you know when you decompress an image, you got exactly what you started with. Um, but it had a limited palette. Uh, it still has a limited palette, 256 colors. We tried to dither our images to make them better. But um, overall, that's kind of a limitation, I'd say, of GIF. Uh, and there were some issues with the compression. It's not really great at compression. Uh, and also, there were licensing issues with GIF uh, when it came out. Um, so a couple of large corporations held copyrights on the uh, compression algorithm. And that made the free software movement hesitant to rely on these formats. Uh, this format uh, and and um, it actually like resulted in PNG coming along later. Uh, also, people are uncertain how to pronounce it. Is it GIF? Is it GIF? To this day, people are still debating this hotly. I'm sure everyone here has their own opinion about it. I'm going with GIF for the for the purposes of this talk. Um, and also animation, like is is animated GIF really a good idea? Is that something you should have in an image format? Probably not. Um, one of the really bad things about image, uh, images with animation is that the compression happens frame by frame. So it tends to be very poor compared to a movie uh, format where the compression is the differences between each frame. Um, so if you uh, convert a, a GIF into a, a, a movie and put it on your web page instead, you'll get like 10 times, 20 times the compression level. Um, 
And since all browsers support movies, I really don't think uh, animation belongs in image formats anymore. Uh, but at the time, it was pretty exciting. Then along came JPEG 30 years ago. Also supported everywhere. Anywhere you can use an image, you can use a JPEG. Um, it had lossy compression. This is a pretty big deal. Uh, lossy compression, we take it for granted now, but when it came about, it was a very exciting feature. And, and part of that is the variable level of compression, right? So you can choose to compress an image uh, a little bit and get uh, a very high quality image, or you can go all the way down to a very a huge amount of compression and uh, get a low quality result. So that variability meant that you could actually sort of choose the appropriate compression for where that image was going to be used. And that was a, a, kind of a new thing that JPEG introduced. Um, and the compression was great. The lossy compression can be up to 10 times versus the original image. So you can really get, you know, really nice quality images and, and load them without, without a lot of uh, resources. It also had full accurate color. So 24 bit color with, uh, color profiles embedded in the image, which was, which was amazing. Um, not perfect, but still amazing. It has progressive decoding. So that's where JPEGs can do that thing where they kind of start out blurry and then the, the details load in. So that's a great experience for users over a slower uh, internet connection. They can, they can get the, uh, the sense of the image coming in well before the full image is loaded. Um, uh, but some downside, it's 30 years old. The compression is not really that great. Uh, with the modern formats, as we'll see, do a much, much better job at uh, compressing images. And there's also really no progressive decoding in WordPress, unfortunately. So when you upload your images to WordPress, uh, when we create the sub sizes that you serve up on the front end, that we serve up on the front end, those are not progressively decoded images because of the kind of underlying server architecture of how WordPress runs, generally speaking. Uh, this is sort of a generalization. You might you might be able to work around this, but uh, we don't really get to take advantage of that in WordPress. Next comes SVG, um, and feel free to ask me any questions here. If I'm I'm, I'm just going to go through these, but feel free to interrupt me. This is uh, interactive if you want it to be. Uh, there's the pig driving the car. Uh, the SVG format is 21 years old, so been around a while. Um, it's very widely supported. You can use it almost everywhere an image is supported. Images scale to any resolution. This is probably the signature feature of SVG. Um, you know, it, it's built of shapes and, and, and curves and lines and angles. So it, it, it scales to any resolution. It's not made up of pixels that get blurry. So that's a really huge thing for things like logos. Um, it's very efficient. So it's super small file sizes for things that it's appropriate for like illustrations. You can style it with CSS, so you can do super cool things with SVGs that you really can't do with any other image format, um, like apply color uh, color overlays or just all kinds of really neat CSS tricks uh, applied to images. Um, it's scriptable and interactive, so SVGs can actually have JavaScript running inside them, uh, which makes them sort of, sort of an interactive image format, which is different than any other image format. Um, but that's actually not a great thing, uh, it turns out because it's a security concern. Because SVGs can contain scripts, uh, it becomes dangerous to allow people to upload them to their website. And for that reason, WordPress to this day, WordPress core does not support SVG uh, natively. So you can get a plugin and get SVG support, but you will not be able to do it by default. And the reason for that is the, the ticket that's been open for like a decade to add support uh, has been objected to for security concerns. It's really only suitable for certain images. So again, not for photographs, really for illustrations. You can posterize photographs and, and do some neat things like that. In general, it's, it's only appropriate for certain types of images. All right, then along comes PNG. 15 years old, so, so still quite old. Uh, been around for quite a while. Really works almost anywhere you can use an image. Um, it's, it's really a successor to the GIF format without the licensing issues. Um, so it really, that was the aim of it when it was created was to replace GIF um, and, and sort of supplant it without the, the, the licensing issues that existed at the time. Um, it has full and accurate color unlike GIF, so not limited in color palette and also has color profiles. Um, it also introduced alpha channel transparency, which is, a, which is a big deal for things like product images. So alpha channel transparency is uh, a layer essentially in your image that defines how transparent each pixel is. And that enables you to, to make images that have very smooth 
um, background, uh, smooth edges as they overlay a background. So PNGs are actually way better than GIF for doing any kind of transparency um, because of this alpha transparency feature. Um, but they didn't support animation. You could say that's a pro actually, but I'll list it as a con here because it was a feature that GIF supported. There are PNGs that support that now, but just in general as a format, it didn't support it. Um, and it only supported uh, lossless compression. So no lossy compression like JPEG. Um, which means that, again, the compression really wasn't that great. So I want to take a brief detour before we talk about uh, the modern image formats and talk a little bit about image quality and how to think about image quality. Because when you get into the modern image formats, this is very much uh, something you have to consider because part of their goal is to, is to do better compression uh, with, with lost compression. And when you talk about better compression, you the more you compress something, the, the lower the quality. So you have to talk about what is the quality at a given level of compression. You can't you can't talk about um, quality without talking about compression level. That they're sort of two sides of the same conversation. So how do you think about image quality? What 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 does an image look like? You know, if we, if we take these two images and I put them up on your screen, can people tell me which one is the better quality image? Right. And I, I think no matter how much time I give you, you will not be able to figure it out. It's kind of a trick question. The one on the left is high, high quality, 90. And the one on the right on my screen anyway is quality 40. Um, so 70% smaller. Uh, but you really can't tell the difference unless you zoom in. And certainly not when you're watching a live video stream where there's a ton of compression being added to the video. Um, there's no way that you could tell the difference between these two images. And even if I zoom in on the original compressed images, I can only tell the difference when I look at very fine details, like um, you know the, the little tiny flower details in the middle. So the point here is the context matters. Where you're viewing the image uh, can determine what quality you, you really want an image to be. Uh, if it's going to be displayed very small, like a thumbnail, the quality is can't doesn't need to be very high. Um, but if it's a product image, it's going to be high resolution, that people are going to be really looking at the details, then you probably want a much higher quality um, image. Um, so how do you test that quality? There's there's algorithms like SSIM, um, right, that, that compare quality. Someone said the left one looks more vibrant. Um, yeah, it, it's not just about the structure. It's also about the color, like how are the colors represented? And there's all kinds of these algorithmic tests that you can do. Um, that will help you kind of compare, like how similar is this image to the original image? Okay, now at this compression level, how similar is it to the original image? And you can run those algorithms against different compression levels and different image formats and try to understand how the quality compares. The, the, where that falls short is that um, algorithms tend to have a predictable um, bias that, you know, so a structural uh, similarity test might be biased against something like JPEG that produces blocky artifacting versus a format like WebP that tends to produce a maybe more blurry image, um, but less less blockiness. So uh, the, the problem with these uh, algorithms is they, they tend to be biased in a certain way that's predictable, and the actual compression algorithms tend to be written to uh, kind of meet those, those tests, so to speak. Um, and there's another way to test, which is basically human-based tests. You sit people down uh, in front of a computer uh, and you have two versions of an image and you ask them to compare it to the original. Uh, you know, you, is this one different than the original? Does it look worse? Does it look as good? And you repeat that test over and over with different types of images, different compression levels. And you do the same, you get the same kind of result that you get from an algorithmic test. You get a plot of different qualities over different compression levels. Uh, and it's the same type of, of test. And there's even algorithms that are designed to, to sort of try to mimic how humans perceive images. Um, none of these are perfect. Um, you really have to do a variety of tests to come up with meaningful results. But what you get is you get a bunch of data points that you plot out on a graph. And, and they compare you know, the, the quality of an image on a scale from here to zero to one, for example, with the file size uh, here given as bits per pixel. Um, but, but what you can understand from this uh, is that, you know, at a, at a given file size, let's say 0.5, that maybe that's half the original size, a JPEG will, will produce this quality and a WebP will produce this quality. That's how you read a graph like this. So, or you can go from a quality level and determine the file size. 
And so what you see in a graph like this is that in general, over, over a wide variety of compression levels and, and, and data points, these have all been sort of averaged out here, WebP performs better. It has a higher quality for a smaller file size until you get to higher quality levels. And then uh, JPEG actually maybe performs slightly better or they're equal. Um, um, so that, have a, yeah. I'm sorry, we have a question in the chat. Awesome. Um, is the compression in the spatial domain only or also color or luminance? Yeah, so it's it's all, I think it's all of the above. And I, I don't have like detailed technical knowledge about how the compression works internally, but I do know that um, like with the testing, um, some of that testing is specifically around colors and, and certain color channels. And so I know that compression formats, you know, they, they compress color differently than they compress detail information. And so what you look at when you try to say if something is a good quality can be determined by that, right? By what, what test you're using essentially. I, I probably didn't really answer the question, but hopefully that um, is, that's my best attempt <laughs> to say yes, have... it includes both, yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh no, I, I had a follow-up. Uh, Weston says, sure. thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, based off of the, the graph you're showing with WebP and JPEG and talking about the algorithms to test <laughs> the quality, yes. um, we do have a few questions from folks about like, how do I you know determine the best image quality? And I'm just wondering, is it realistic for someone, you know, project manager at a digital agency to like ask for these kinds of tests to be run in order to select the best? image quality or is there just a basic right. one that people would just should just yeah use? no and and there isn't like the short answer is there isn't a best quality right it it it, deter it depends on the image so even with something like this here where it shows like on this chart it shows that webp consistently outperforms jpeg that doesn't mean there's not going to be an outlier where you might create a, a jpeg that's actually smaller than a webp of the same size um and that's because the compression algorithms work differently and they tend to do better with certain types of images than others. Um, so there, it isn't, there isn't going to be either a compression quality level that's always perfect um, or a particular image format that's always perfect. Um, but you can say something like WebP on average will be smaller than JPEG uh, at the same quality, at the same quality level. Um, so you, you get an advantage if you want to keep your quality consistent of smaller file sizes, meaning you know, faster load times. Um, but it's always a trade-off. You know, you have to understand that it's a trade-off. And um, I think, you know, in terms of, of the quality that you use, that depends again on the context where, you know, if it's something like thumbnails, the quality maybe could be lower if, it, if it's a product page or if it's a, a large image where you're really trying to highlight the quality of something, then you need to use a higher quality. Um, and of course, WordPress doesn't by default let you control these things at a fine grain level. This chart here is really more for people who are deciding which format we should use in WordPress, uh, or maybe you know which format you should use by default. Um, not something you would look at like for each individual image, because it's more of like an average of a whole set of images. Thank you. Oh, hopefully that helped. Um, okay, so let's let's move on. Unless other people have questions, I will move on. Cool. I'm going to go into the modern formats. Um, so WebP is the one that I was just uh, comparing before. It's 12 years old, so it's actually been quite around quite a while, almost almost as long as uh, the the last ones we looked at, uh, PNG. And it's very widely supported. Pretty much works everywhere. Works in all the browsers. Um, it works on pretty much any WordPress site. Um, out there because almost all hosts support it. Not every single one, but by and large, it's going to be supported on your WordPress site. It offers lossless and lossy compression. So this is actually a big deal. I'm going to get to why it is, but unlike all the, so unlike all the formats that came before, before, if you wanted to choose between lossy and lossless, that meant choosing between formats. Uh, should I use PNG or JPEG? Um, but now one format can actually do both lossless and lossy compression. And it also has the animation that GIF had, and it has the alpha transparency support that, um, that PNG introduced. So pretty much what you can see here, other than the vector support of SVG, is that WebP kind of aims to have all of the features um, that the previous image formats had before it. 
Um, and where this gets really exciting is when you think about something like uh, a product image with a transparent background, where previously you really your only choice to do a, a really high quality product image with a transparent background would be PNG, um, which is a great format, but it only offers lossless compression. So you're only going to get like maybe 15% compression over the original image. When you switch that to WebP and use a lossy compression, still gaining, still with the alpha transparency, um, you get like 85% better compression. Um, so it's it's a huge improvement or maybe 70%, but it's a huge improvement. Uh, and so the combination of all these previous features into one format is actually a real boost for what we can do with images on the web. Um, it also, you know, it has the full and accurate color like, like JPEGs do as well. So it's got color profiles and high bit color. Um, and it's also got fast decoding. This will this will become clear why this is important as I get to the next two formats. Um, but basically, as your web browser, uh, you know, decodes a compressed the compressed WebP, it's just as fast as as JPEGs. Um, it is a little slower on the encoding side. So this is when you upload an image to WordPress and it it creates all the sub sizes. This takes a little bit longer with WebP than it does with JPEG because it's a little more computationally intensive. Um, there's also are still some support gaps. So particularly after you, uh, if you were to download a WebP image from someone's website who was using the WebP format, uh, and then try to use that image, the WebP image, in certain contexts, it may not work. A good example of this, last I checked, is GitHub issues. If you try to upload a WebP image on a GitHub issue, they reject that image format. They don't support it. They could at any time start supporting it, but they haven't. And so this is always something we're going to suffer from with a newer format like WebP. It just hasn't been around as long. Uh, another example would be like maybe Paint, uh, the Paint application on Microsoft Windows. If you're still using that, maybe it hasn't been updated to support WebP. So there's always going to be places where you can't use WebP as well as JPEG. And that is kind of a, a shortcoming that will never really fully be able to overcome. But in terms of using it on your website, it really is compatible with, with almost everyone. Um, and it's uh, got some great advantages. Next format up is ABIF, very young, less than three years or maybe about three years old now. Uh, it's well supported. Safari, Apple announced uh, support for Safari. So Edge is the only outstanding browser that doesn't um, support it directly. Um, it has both the lossless and the lossy compression, the animation and the alpha transparency, the full and the accurate color, and it has very high compression. So even better than WebP does, uh, something like 50% improvement over the lossy compression of JPEG. Uh, unfortunately, it, it does have some shortcomings uh, that maybe will be addressed in the future, but it, it is slow and expensive at encoding and decoding images as compared to JPEG or WebP. Um, so your images are much slower to, to compress when you upload them. And even the decoding part is, uh, is more expensive. And this can really play out, especially on low power devices. So if you think about, um, oh, someone put a comment in there. Ah, interesting. I, I, and th they said, uh, I just, I'm reading a comment from the chat that says that they downloaded a WebP image and tried to open it in Photoshop, it opened as a camera raw file. So Photoshop succeeded in opening it. Um, Annie, I guess, is your name. Uh, and, and yes, it did. OK, well, that's good. Uh, so maybe it doesn't support it directly uh, fully yet. Um, but I know that support is, is growing. Um, AVIF also like only recently gained Photoshop support. This is kind of a challenge with, with modern images is how are you using them? If it's just for your website, um, then all you need is the browser support. But if you're using them outside of the browser, then, then you have to consider the whole ecosystem of all the tools that we use to process images. Uh, or, to, or to use images. Um, so another big gap with AVIF support or, or a problem is uh, server support. So you, with WordPress, when you upload an image, um, the recompression of that image happens on the server using PHP. And uh, right now you need PHP 8.1 to get support for AVIF. So it, unless you're on some special host that has AVIF support or using like an image CDN, uh, you need to be on the very latest version or close to the latest version of PHP to get uh, AVIF. And, and then kind of the newest kit on the block is JPEG XL. Um, it is less than a year old or maybe a year old now. It has everything that these last formats have had, the lossless and lossy, the animation and alpha support, the full and accurate color, efficient encoding and decoding, uh, unlike AVIF. So it, it's actually efficient like a WebP and very high compression like AVIF. So it kind of combines those two things. Um, 
It has this amazing feature, which uh, is that it can losslessly re-encode JPEG. So if you have a JPEG image that's compressed, you can recompress it using this new JPEG XL, get the better compression level without losing any information, which is not a normal thing. Normally, when you recompress compressed images, it kind of it kind of increases the it loses information in that process, I guess. Um, and it has another amazing feature, which is this advanced saliency-based progressive decoding. Um, so this is just to describe it in a very rough way: is um, just the way that JPEG images can can decompress um progressively so you get that sort of blurry image at first and then the, then the details come in as the data is loaded uh with jpeg xl you can do that but you can tell you can define in the image with a layer where you want that uh, new detail to emerge first where the data should be used so for example uh you can have an image where uh, there's some people in the middle and the, the focus of their faces comes into focus first, the detail of the time in the background. Um, so it's a really cool progressive loading technique that JPXL has. Um, so in terms of disadvantages, it's not supported anywhere. So you can't use it in any modern browser. It, it is available behind a flag uh, in some browsers, but, but not really available to, to most users. And it's also not supported on servers. No, no PHP version supports it. Um, so even though it's this amazing format and, and you you can test it out, and they have encoders and decoders for it. Um, you you can't actually use it in a browser, so it's not something that we can really use on the web today. Uh, the people who are developing JPEG XL very much want to make it a format um, for the web, but it's a little bit of a catch-22 where the the tooling hasn't caught up. Um, some of the advantages there's sort of a a little bit of a, a kind of I don't know competition, I would say, between the JPEG XL and AVIF uh, format creators where they're they're trying to outdo each other in terms of the, how much compression they can achieve and what features they have. Um, the real advantage that AVIF right right, has right now is the adoption, the fact that it actually works in, in modern browsers. Um, so JPEG XL is an exciting format, but not really one that we can actually use today. So um, that brings me to, yeah. Sorry, I had a <laughs> yeah, I had yeah, a perfect time for question. <laughs> Yay! Excellent. Excellent. And anyone else, please feel free to unmute or ask a question in the chat. Um, I had like a kind of foundational question, I guess. Like, yeah, who are all of these image formats open source? Like, who's making these? <laughs> um, they are they are, I think, largely developed in the open. I do think that um, like Google has owned the WebP format in the sense of I it is an open source project, but it's been largely led by Google. And I think AVIF is the same way. Um, I think AVIF is also closely related to a video format that I'm not gonna get the right, someone put it in the chat. It's it's closely related to some other format that's a video format, AVI, I think, uh, is the format. Um, in terms of how it does compression, the JPEG um, has like a consortium that, that runs the JPEG project. There's actually a bunch of different JPEG formats other than the, this one and the one that we're all familiar with. Like there's one called JPEG 2000, um, but JPEG XL is very much the one that they've been trying to get adopted for browsers. Um, so I think they're, they are generally open source, but they're also like big companies behind them. Got it, thank you. Yeah. And this, this next section that I have is about like how WordPress handles images. So this is a good place to kind of stop and take any questions that people have about the image formats themselves. So unmute or put them. Oh yeah, AV1 is the, is the closely related format. Thank you for putting that in the chat, Destiny. Um, I'm gonna sip on my coffee while you all think of questions. Or I'll just keep talking. <clears throat> okay. Oh yeah, HEI. I think it's HEIF the format. Okay, so there's a few questions. I'll I'll go through in order, and then if you have more, put them in there. Um, I guess, Laura, is that a question you, you have to format and resize before starting a site or are you just making, maybe that's just a comment. 
Um, next one is from Weston. If you have a big image, what are the options to reduce the file size? Okay. So, I mean, big image, I, I think you mean uncompressed. I, I, I guess like when we take pictures with our camera, like our phones, a lot of them are just these giant megapixel, 16 megapixel images. You can definitely resize those in a tool to get down to a reasonable size before uploading them. After you upload them, WordPress is going to recompress them. It's going to take whatever size you upload, let's say it's 5,000 pixels wide, and it's gonna create multiple sub sizes, which I'm gonna talk about in this next section if I get to it. Um, so the, the biggest thing there is to choose a, a good compression level. Um, and I'm sure there's plugins that let you fine tune this as well for each specific size. So you might look at something like that. But in general, the WordPress default level of 82 is a pretty good choice for images that still look good, but, but are, are pretty well compressed. Um, so I think accepting the default is, is fine if you're using WordPress. If you wanna get better compression out of WordPress itself, I would recommend look, considering the WebP format. Um, and there's probably simple plugins that will let you just output WebP by default. That's a core capability currently, and most servers support that. Um, the other op option would be um, to use an image CDN. That is a great choice, especially if your host has one that they provide. Uh, there's free ones out there, or I think you know if, if you have a site that's important to, you, to your business, then it's probably worth paying for one. Um, and in terms of reasoning, the other thing you can do if you really want to get fun, have fun with an image size, um, is use a tool like uh, squish.app, um, which is a web-based, I'm going to get the address here in my other window. Um, I think it's just squish.app, yeah. Uh, it's a web-based, I'll put it in the chat, uh, image compression tool, and it kind of gives you a before after, and you can try different image formats and different compression levels, and even within different compression, um, formats like JPEG, there's there's actually different compression algorithms that are available. So I didn't touch on that, but you know, um, a lot of people talk about Moz JPEG as, as an improvement over default JPEG. And that's true. You can use that to, to create your images. Um, one thing to be aware of though is that you know WordPress is going to recompress those. So if you want to create a like highly optimized image for say the top of a, like a hero image for a particular page, what you want to do is use a tool like Squish to get it to just the right size and the right quality level, and then you want to upload and use the full-sized image that you've uploaded, which will be sort of the original image, which is normally not what you want to do. Normally, you want to use those compressed images that WordPress creates, um, because those will be at the various sizes. Um, but if you're like highly optimizing a, an image and, and like spending a lot of time making that compression level and image uh, format choice, then it's probably something you wanted to handle more manually. Um, I'm going to go back to the questions. So there's a lot of stuff in the in the chat to catch up on. But I, when someone asked about the HEIF format, but I just want to say that's a super interesting use case because it's it's the format that iPhones now use by default, um, and Apple actually hides this a lot from end users. Basically, they make it very easy to use these formats, even if you're using a tool that doesn't support them. Like if you drag and drop a, a HEIF into a web upload in Safari, I'm pretty sure it automatically converts it into a JPEG behind the scenes for you. And similarly, if you try to open it on, on desktop and Mac and a tool that doesn't support it, it automatically will convert it for you. So it, it does hide that. And obviously, Apple gives you the ability to switch that to, to JPEG. Um, but this is a real challenge. Like, There's no way in a browser, for example, to tell the browser that when you right click to download something that you want it in a different format, like save as JPEG would be a killer browser feature for solving this problem. Um, although it doesn't, it has its own issues. Uh, OK, missed SVG and PNG slides. Can we see those two again? I'll just very quickly go back there um, and leave those open for a minute. And you can ask questions if you have specifically about these. So there's the SVG one. I'll just leave that open. Um, is there one image format you can suggest that to use supported on every device and browser? That would be WebP. Um, I would say WebP is supported everywhere. The only Exceptions to that would be um, certain email newsletters, like if you're emailing to, you know, you have Windows Outlook clients, um, or if you know you have really old Safari users, um, then you might not be able to use WebP. But other than that, I would recommend WebP as sort of the default output format. And WordPress has a filter, that, like a one-line filter that will change its default output format. So it's very easy to do, and there's, there's plugins that do that as well. Um, 
is the general rule of thumb a photo on a site shouldn't be more than 100K? I, I know people would love me to give a cutoff. I don't think there is a cutoff really. I think it depends on your users. Um, this is one thing when we're trying to measure performance, it's important not just to look at how fast the site loads for you, um, but how fast it loads for your users. And the way you do this is you get real user metrics or RUM data. Um, there's a couple different ways you can collect that. One is with JavaScript on your site. Another, if your site is big enough, is to use public data sets um, like the Crux or HTTP Archive data set. Um, but, but really, you can't answer that question um, as a rule of thumb. I mean, I, I, I'd love to give you a number. Uh, it used to be 50K, I remember, probably 100K is reasonable. Um, but if you're a photographer and your images are, you know, super high quality, then no, like they should be much larger than that. And uh, if you exist in a market where people have low powered devices and limited bandwidth, then they should absolutely be much smaller than that. So it really varies. Um, there, there isn't a, an answer. There isn't one answer. Um, Cool. Some people answered and explained what I said, CDN, Content Delivery Network. Um, image CDNs are, are a really cool way to serve images. Um, in part, oh, I'm going to go to the next slide, too, just because someone asked about the PNG one. Um, what an image CDN does, um, and, and like if you install Jetpack, for example, and use their uh, Photon image integration, that's an image CDN. And, and what that does is it will take the original image that you've uploaded to WordPress, and it will serve it up to users in whatever the best format their browser supports is. So if their browser supports AVIF, they'll get an AVIF version. If their browser supports WebP, they'll get a WebP version. Um, and it often image CDNs will also resize the image so that it's exactly the right size for you, how you've served it on your on your web page. WordPress tries to do that. So we when you upload, we create multiple sizes, but uh, we don't create every possible size. And and if they use if you are editing your site and you drag the image and make it a little smaller, uh, you might get into a situation where the size that you've specified is, is different than the available sizes. So we do our best guess. With an image CDN, it can actually just sort of resize things on the fly. Um, so that's the real big advantage, the ability to dynamically serve the right format and the right size. Um, so um, I'm gonna jump back into, unless people have questions, I have like 20 more minutes. So I, I'm gonna jump back into slides, is that, is that good, Destiny? Should I do that? Yes, I think that sounds great. Okay. And feel free to unmute if you if you all have questions. I, I think I answered everything in the chat, but I easily could have missed something because it was a lot. And it's hard to read things while you're talking. You got everything, don't worry. <laughs> okay, cool. So just, just want to briefly talk about WordPress and images. Um, so we're all familiar with the media library. Probably if you've uploaded images to WordPress, you spend at least a little bit of time in this nice grid view that we have in the media library. I want to give a shout out to the list view, which a lot of people are not aware of. Um, you get to that by clicking this little list view icon here in the upper left. And there's actually a bunch of features that are available in list view that are not available in the grid view. So check it out. Um, you can also upload images directly in the editor now. So this is the experience where an image is in the process of being uploaded. It's slightly different than uploading them in the media library, even though they wind up in the media library as well. Um, when you upload images to WordPress, the, the original file is, is stored on the server. Um, it is always, the original file that you upload is always stored indefinitely on the WordPress server unless you do some special thing to delete it. Um, that's uh, kind of part of our core philosophy of like it's your data, the user's data. We don't we don't touch it. Um, so everything we do at this point is creating other copies of your image. Um, and the really great thing about that is that uh, like if you uploaded all your images years ago before we had AVIF as a format, that doesn't matter. You can still regenerate your images using a plugin like Regenerate Images, and you will get whatever new format you have set up on your WordPress site because it will, we always have that original image. We can always regenerate uh, the, the sub sizes that are specified. So BHP is the, is the, you know, the kind of tool, the, the programming language that the web server is running on, that the web server is providing, that WordPress is running on. And it uses two underlying libraries, GD or libgd and Imagic like image magic, but scrunched together imagic to create all the various sizes. So you're familiar with large, medium thumbnail. There's also medium large. There's also a couple HDPI or high definition images that we create if you upload a large enough image. Um, if you upload an image over a certain dimension, which is by default something like 
2048 by 2048. Um, those are considered extra large images and we resize that into a scaled version. Again, we always keep the original, but we make a scaled version that's just at that largest size that we think is, is a reasonable size to serve on the web. And then of course, plugins or themes can add their own custom sizes. So, you know, in, in some cases you might have half a dozen or a dozen different images being generated when you upload one image to WordPress. Um, so other than when you insert from URL, every time you upload an image, you're going to get this process of creating the sub sizes. Right now, that process is, uh, I would say, semi asynchronous. It, it happens on the server in the background, but as an end user, you have to sit there and wait for it to complete. So either in Gutenberg, in the block editor, or in the media library, if you navigate away, uh, that breaks the upload. So we that's something we really need to fix in core is to make that process continue in the background, even as the if the user agent leaves the page. Um, but we also handle some other things which are kind of cool that you might not be aware of, uh, including image rotation. So if you take a, a photo with your phone and it's rotated into a, a you know horizontal or vertical aspect, that rotation is actually recorded as part of the image metadata. And WordPress handles that when you upload it and properly re-rotates the image, um, no matter what the rotation is to begin with. Um, and like I mentioned before, WordPress can automatically generate images in a different format, like WebP, um, with a simple filter that we have in place. There's no UI for that. Um, but, but again, just a plugin will, will enable that for you. Uh, a couple other things, just a shout out to the editor we have built in uh, to WordPress where you can rotate images. That's also available. The cropping is available right inside Gutenberg. Um, and you can also rotate and flip images in the media library. Um, WordPress handles high definition images by default. So when you upload large enough images, we'll generate those HDPI versions. So if you're using like a retina screen on a Mac, this is the most common use case, you get these very high resolution images, um, which is really cool. Something else I learned while working on images in the last year is that the web also supports HDR or high dynamic range images. And uh, the AVIF format currently supports that. So you can actually load a photographer's website that's linked from this core ticket and see these amazing images that the, uh, I had fun dragging them from my desktop, my, from my MacBook to my uh, monitor. And you can just see the difference between a, a high color screen and a normal screen. It's, it's stunning, actually. Um, really only applies probably to photographers who are doing high depth, you know, HDR photography, but uh, still a really cool thing to, to know about um, that's out there and, and currently supported on the web. Um, just to say that in terms of performance and optimization, um, loading images is, is a complex part of a very complex process that browsers go through when they load pages, including loading all this, the you know scripts and, and CSS and the header. And, and how big your image is, is, how large that image file is, only has a small part to play in the overall experience of end users on your site. So while optimizing images is a valuable thing to do, it's not um, the end all to solving all of your problems. Um, and even though images frequently come up um, in, in reviews of, of website performance, like if you run a lighthouse test on your website, you'll frequently have the largest image um, marked as a problem. Um, that, that's true and making that image smaller will help, but there's often a lot of other things that go into why that image is slow that aren't just about the size of the image. They're about how the page is structured and what other things the browser has to do before it gets to loading the image. Um, so just to wrap up with this section on like why this matters, um, you know, why smaller images do matter. Um, you know, you're, you're building a website, you're, you're coming up with an image to put at the top of your page. You want it to look as good as possible. At the same time, you don't really want to make the experience bad for your users. Um, and overall, WordPress has a problem with this. Uh, this, is a, this is a problem we know that WordPress has. Um, when we look at uh, WordPress sites on the Core Web Vitals technology report, um, we see that, you know, of the, of the Core Web Vital metrics, the LCP is the, the largest contentful paint is the one that um, WordPress suffers most on it. And, and I'm gonna briefly describe what this is, um, but just to say that only 35% of WordPress sites in the wild do well with this metric. Um, and, and what this metric is, is part of the, what we call the pillars of user experience uh, on the web. So there's three main components. Uh, there's like, is the web page loading? 
is it does it is it interactive does it respond to user interactivity and is it visually stable like is are things popping around or, or is it stable for, for end users and we measure these through these three core web vital metrics largest contentful paint first input delay and cumulative layout shift and these are metrics that google developed um, that chrome developed to try to provide a way to gauge user experience in a measurable way. And they're not set in stone, they're actually changing. So there's a new metric that's been introduced this year um, called interaction to next paint. Um, but just to focus right now on the largest contentful paint metric, that's the one that WordPress currently really has a, a tough time with. Um, and so what this is, is basically um, what, what it sounds like. It's, it's when does the largest element on a page complete painting. So this is a little different than how we used to think about performance with like, you know, when is the first byte delivered or when is the page completely loaded? This is to say, when is the largest thing on the page completely loaded? That's sort of when the user feels like the page is completely loaded. There may still be some other things that are loading, um, but but that big image has loaded. So that's, that's sort of what we're trying to measure here as a good experience. It's usually a large image, um, but it sometimes could be a large block of text. Um, but in the case of a large image, this is where optimizing the image can, can actually make a big difference. Um, another thing to think about with images, and this is not just the one that's at the top of the page, but all the images on your page, is that they cost users to download these images. You know, we're used to having unlimited bandwidth uh, and not paying for our Wi-Fi beyond our, you know, for our usage, but that's not the case in a lot of the world. Um, so depending on where your users are, um, it might cost them like per megabyte to download your images. So there's an actual cost. Uh, and even if users aren't paying directly for this with their dollars, there is like an energy and environmental cost to storing and transmitting all of this data. So um, there is an actual cost to larger than needed imagery. Um, and then just to kind of wrap up like where I see this going uh, in the future. Oh. Any thoughts? I, there's some questions. I'm going to answer a question. Any thoughts on WP changing these default sizes? They've been around for over 15 years. Um, changing things in WordPress is very hard. Uh, changing anything in WordPress. Um, we, we did add one new default size um, in something like WordPress 4.7. That's the medium large size. And that experience was, was painful. Um, we broke image uploading for a certain percentage of WordPress sites. I don't know what that percentage was. It might've been 2% or 5%, but it was still millions and millions of sites that suddenly couldn't upload images just because we introduced one new size and core. Um, what we discovered from that is that our upload process was extremely fragile. Uh, and since then we improved it somewhat. Um, now uh, it's more resilient. So we actually retry if, if the processing fails and we'll retry up to several times to get that process to complete. Um, so it's a little more robust, but not as robust as what I was talking about before, which would be fully asynchronous image um, compression happening in the background without the user agent needing to, to be present. Um, in terms of changing the defaults, um, you know, the, the, the those are actually user editable fields. So the defaults are there like when you set up your WordPress, but they're not stored. I mean, they're actually like stored as data database entry so you, users can change them at least for those default sizes i don't i don't know like what I, I guess the only thing that would prompt us to change them would be some like really strong reason we needed a certain size like the reason we added the medium large size was there was a, a gap we sort of had this gap between the medium size and the large size when we were building out source sets and we realized oh we're sort of missing one sort of fundamental size that's very commonly used on the web so the only argument for adding a new size would be okay we need we really want HTTP, uh, you know, high definition thumbnails or some use case that, and for, for it to be in core, it needs to be beneficial to 80% of our users as a kind of a philosophy. So it has to be something that, it, you know, and of course you can do this now with, um, with a plugin. It's not like you can't do it. It's just like, is it a default thing? I guess is the question. Um, question, could you explain GD library and Imagic again? What happens when you upload a photo to the media library? Yep. So, um, so PHP itself um, currently bundles the GDlib library as part of PHP. But previous to version, I think 8.0, those were separate things. So, if you are a web host and you're building your server, you're you're setting up your server. You're either using a pre-built kind of bundle that has your PHP and your Apache, or you're actually literally like compiling the software. Uh, and when you're doing that compilation, you can bring in libraries that add support into the web server. 
And one of those libraries would be the image libraries. So these are, uh, like, like I said, GD is now bundled with PHP by default, but previously you had to choose sort of which one you wanted to use and GD and Imagic were the two main ones. Um, so WordPress supports those by default. Um, and what that means is that if your web server has Imagic available, we'll use Imagic. It's considered, I guess, the more robust. It's the default if it's available in WordPress. Uh, and then if not, it will use GD. GD is always available. Um, now, which version of GD do you have? That depends on which version has been bundled or built into PHP at the time that it was built. And so if your host is using a, a pre-built package like a Ubuntu release, for example, it will depend on the version of that of that release that they're using. So it will depend on your host. Um, and uh, there's different versions of GD, there's different versions of Imagex. So there's, you know, it's it's not just like which one are you using, but also which version. And that can affect compression, for example, because things like WebP have improved over time. Um, um, I hope I answered that question. Uh, when you upload them to the media library, WordPress creates multiple sub sizes for you. So <clears throat> you upload your original, WordPress creates four, five, six, seven, ten, however many sub sizes. Those are all stored alongside your original image. And and when you look at the source code of of your website on the front end, um, and you look, you'll see that we we serve up what's called a source set. So instead of just one URL for your image you'll see all the URLs referenced that, that have been created. And what they're designed to do is load depending on breakpoints, depending on the width of the screen. So smaller screens, like a, like a mobile phone, will get a different image size served to them than a larger screen. Um, and, and, and in a responsive theme, you know, it might, it might be several different breakpoints where different sized images would be served. And then similarly with a high definition screen, if you're on a Mac with a, with a high definition screen, you'll get served a higher definition image, um, like twice the resolution that you otherwise would be. Um, okay, I'm gonna answer another question. Oh, I think the core WordPress performance team works to find these kinds of improvements. Absolutely, thanks for that link. I am on that team and we've been actively working on trying to land WebP as a core feature. Uh, we did land it as, as a core feature in terms of WebP uh, being available in 5.8, but in 6.1, we sort of failed to make it the default. Uh, and I'm hoping that at some point in the future, we can we can change that and make it the default. Um, but if you can install the Performance Lab plugin, which is available in the repository and developed by the performance team, and that has the all the kind of features that we built out for, for image, including some really cool ones like an experimental uh, feature called Fetch Priority, which allows us to kind of tell the browser that um, the a particular image is the most important image, like the, what we think is the LCP image and prioritize its loading. I had a slide that I skipped over before about how bri browsers prioritize loading. And it's a very, very complex process. And, and so part of what we're trying to look at on the performance team is how can we hint or signal to the browser, hey, this is the image that you should prioritize. Um, um, Martha had a question. I compress my images in Photoshop, then I upload them to media library. Are they getting compressed again? So the answer is yes, they are. Um, and which image size you use can determine whether your original upload is, is being used. So and this is what I was talking before about the full sized image. So when you upload an image and insert it into Gutenberg, into the block editor, um, you can choose which size to use, like full, medium, large. The full size is referring to the original image that you uploaded, as long as it's not larger than the scaled um, cutoff, which is 20 something, 2048, and can be changed by plugins. Um, so what I would recommend to verify that, Martha, is, is to upload your image, select in Gutenberg like the full size image, save, publish the post, and then go look at the post, look at the source code, look at the image, make sure it's the same image. Like it should have the same file name, exactly the same file name. If it has a dash and a number by it, then it's one of the compressed images that WordPress creates. Because when we create those sub sizes, the names are, are changed. So it's the original name plus a dash, plus the dimensions, the width and height of the image is added. Um, so you can very quickly tell just by looking at the source code or looking at the image if you download it, whether it's your original upload or one of the recompressed images. But yes, the answer would be we do recompress it regardless um, to create smaller sizes. So if you upload a large image and then say you place it on your homepage in a thumbnail layout or on an archive view in, a, in where the thumbnail version is used, then it's gonna use that smaller version and that's what you want. You don't wanna serve up that huge image generally speaking, in that in that list view. 
pixel width of a hero image meant to take the full width of the browser screen. I think that's a question for your designer <laughs> um, because I, I think it sort of depends on what you're trying to achieve. I love images that are full width and fill my whole page. Um, that's not the best for performance. You know, if, if your goal is to get maximized performance, obviously the bigger your image, the lower the the, the slower it's going to load. So there's a trade-off. It's it's a it's a value decision that you have to make. Um, the larger you know, a, a large image can be super impactful to people when they first visit your website. Um, if if you're a visually oriented company, you are, you're a landscaping company, and you want to show a beautiful landscaping photograph, you know, like you want that to be a large image. Um, so I, I don't have an answer for you, unfortunately, but I would just, I think it just depends on the situation. Uh, and it's it's a trade-off. What you choose is a trade-off. Um, and, you know, the, I guess the best way is um, to to do some research, you know, to test things out, to like try a large image, see how, how your users respond to that, try a smaller image, see how they respond to that. Uh, you can even do A-B testing if you get really fancy, but you can even just do some some sort of informal testing where you try one thing, give it a, give it a chance, see how it performs. Ask your users, you know, if you have an opportunity, try something else. Uh, I don't think there's one answer that that is right for everyone or every situation. Cool. And I managed to use up a whole hour of time. That's amazing. <laughs> Um, all I was going to say in this last section, and I, I guess I'll just say goodbye, is just use an image CDN. That's really your best bet for now. Um, and in the future, there's some things that are coming down the pike that, that could be really exciting where, um, you know, we do more image processing in the browser as opposed to on the server. Um, just like we're, we're moving the editor to being fully JavaScript, like we could do a lot of our image library stuff in WordPress in the browser, and then that would leapfrog some of the limitations that we have on the server. That's it. I'll leave this slide up um, as my final. Thank you, Adam. That was super, super insightful. I learned a lot. I hope folks also got a lot out of this. <laughs> I'm sure they did. Um, I'm going to stop recording and